You got a lot of lights. My first memories at 8043 Coles, my sister was hiding underneath the table and my Auntie Tessie had in her arms. And she was telling me how strange my sister was because she was hiding underneath the table. My other memories right after that are like listening to Flash Gordon on the radio and the Lone Ranger on the radio at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning and going into coal bin in the house and getting yelled at by Auntie Tessie for getting dirty. I don't remember my mother, but I do remember my father, yes. I remember more my Aunt Tessie and my Aunt Mary and my Uncle Stanley than my father. I don't remember my mom. The uh, first time I saw her was when I was maybe a freshman in high school. Before that, I had illusions of, of her being a, a beautiful movie star, and I didn't understand what reality had done to her. But there had been some inner turmoil between her and my father because uh, uh, my father didn't seem to be in the picture. She had to be a very nice woman. I've seen some pictures of her, and she looked like she was very happy with us uh, as children. There were pictures of us at the beach and other places, the three of us, and we all looked, we looked happy and content. We really did. She lived till she was 95. I, I could have gone on a Saturday to see her, and I thought I'd do it on a Sunday, and she died that night. God uh, is funny that way, you know. When he wants you, he wants you. My father, I know his nickname was Ribsy. I know he, at one time he was a heavy drinker and I guess a brawler, he showed me a few scars. He uh, went to the service, he was shot, he had a purple heart. He, I guess he was a kind of a quiet guy. Typically with a child growing up, you know, you look at your father as being 10 feet tall and that's about how, about how it was. He worked quite a bit, he worked in the steel mills and he worked shift work. There were days that when I was just a little kid, I was able to go walk up to 81st and South Shore Drive and sit on the, on the concrete and wait for him to get out of the mill gate. And I would, you know, walk home with him. I mean, he came to some of the baseball games and he would periodically, on a Thursday night, would take me to the Chelton show and we would see a movie. Describing him, he was a, a strict individual. He worked hard. He was there when we really, I guess, needed him. And that was the important thing. My brother was, to me, a perfect human being. He kind of filled the, the void of, of my father not being there as much. My brother was my hero. Uh, he was Big Pots and I was Little Pots. He was a tough, tough kid. He taught me many, many things. One of the things he taught me was that you stand up for people. If somebody was picking on somebody, my brother would step in between. And I wanted to be just like him. And in many ways, I am. You know, it really hurt me when he got sick. Uh, later on in life, uh, when he was 20 years old. My sisters, we used to dance in the basement. We'd do a polka or whatever. I'd be playing cowboys and Indians, and I would think I was Errol Flynn, and I would dance with her and then excuse myself and go and kill some Indians and then come back and dance with her. As a young child growing up, that's a good memory of mine. But she was always snitching on me to my father. They used to call me Skippy. All right, why, I don't know. I remember once we were in a car and Marcia said to my father, Daddy, uh, Skippy called me a name the other day. My dad whacked me and I never said that word again, you know. When I would come home beat up and, and bloody and things, she would, uh, that's what she, I guess she became a nurse, I think because of that. But I have some fond memories of her, but they're kind of hard to remember all the way now. In my whole life, yeah, I never really had the concept of the word love. If I loved anybody, I loved her and I loved my brother. There was Uncle Stanley, not married, a wonderful individual. Auntie Mary, not married, a caring and, and, and beautiful person. And Auntie Tessie, and Auntie Tessie was like the matriarch of the family. She wasn't afraid to do anything. When we came along, they really acted like a mother, the mother and Uncle Stanley acted like a father. And when I was about 13, I started hanging around with my brother. His friends did not like me hanging around with him. Nobody would really say anything because I was Little Pots. I kind of hung around more with my brother and his group. His guys were, they'd go to the schoolyards and play fast pitch or, you know, they'd play basketball and things like that. They were always involved with some kind of sporting thing. So I kind of hung around with that.
I do not know why my brother chose Mount Carmel other than he had a good friend that went to St. Michael's with him that went to Mount Carmel. My brother took the test from Mount Carmel and scored pretty high. That's how he wound up going there. I went to Mount Carmel because he went to Mount Carmel because I didn't do well on the test, but they accepted me because of my brother. I had good study habits. You know, I still didn't do real well. And as time goes on, you know, I wind up with two master's degrees, actually three master's degrees. It's all because I had the stamina because of my brother. I remember Dave Lewandowski, uh, he lived on the next block. And I remember walking to the corner on, on 81st Street and he walked to the corner on 82nd Street. We looked at each other and, and I said, okay, let's go. And we went at it. Damn it, he beat me. And he wound up being one of my best friends. It was a way of life. The, the initiation was, you know, the first fight. Where I really started fighting when I had to was in, uh, in high school. You know, I, I guess I got it from the old neighborhood and I guess I had a reputation of, of, of fighting. Russell Square Park, when we played football after school, one guy might have a helmet, one might, guy might have shoulder pads, when nobody was fully equipped. And the first organizational uh, football I was with was at Mount Carmel freshman year. They had a thing called Frost Off Football. First couple days you'd go out and they had calisthenics. And there were probably over 100 guys would go out. And I remember I was one of the guys that got a uniform, because not everybody got a uniform. After the first football game, I didn't go to practice. I heard so many horror stories about if you miss practice, what would happen. So I never went back and actually handed the equipment in at the end of the season. So I had quit the team. And I remember a guy by the name of Ronnie Dudek. We were standing on the corner, 83rd South Shore Drive. He says, see those guys smoking cigarettes? They'll be here in 30 years not doing anything with their lives. Do you want to do that or do you want to do something? So I was a freshman. I went out for the varsity and I made the team. I can't tell you how I went home and just laid in bed sore and, and I didn't, I had no experience with this. Then when the season came around for double sessions, that was literally hell. First day of practice running at least uh, 10 uh, 440s and calisthenics like you wouldn't believe and, and wind sprints. And I remember that first day, I literally lost 12 pounds. I wound up sticking it out through the season. Football was for tough guys, you know. Baseball, you had to have a skill at it. Football, you didn't, you just had to be tough. I played against a guy every day, Mike Barnes. He did things like one-on-one, -on -one, two-on-one, -on -one, and, and tackling drills and all this other stuff. But when the scrimmage came around, I was the guy that they beat on. I was the guy that played the tackle in the 52 defense or tackle in the 44 defense. I mean, he just beat me to death. After the season was over, you get this inner hatred and, and tenacity in you that makes you want to, it's not going to happen again. And there were maybe three guys in front of me because it was spring practice. One dropped out of school, one got kicked out, one got hurt real bad, and the next thing I know, I'm the first string tackle. And we always had a spring game against the seniors. Who do you think I went against? Mike Barnes. And I didn't do bad. You have to understand the, the type of practices that, that we had in those days. There was no water on the field. You had a wool jersey that you wore, and you ran and you worked out. I mean, to run 1,000 yard wind sprints was, was a daily occurrence. Now in them years too, you gotta remember, you went both ways. I never left the field. Punt team, kickoff team, every uh, goal line, every, there was no such thing as you came off the field. When double sessions came around, I wound up being the starter. And every day I thought I was gonna lose my position. I didn't, I didn't feel I was good enough. And my picture was in the paper and people would say, you're a starter. And the people in the neighborhood would see my picture. And at any time I thought I wasn't gonna make it. The coach we had had before was, was, was not a fair coach. Frank Maloney, first of all, he was a young guy. He was only 22. And he became the head coach and he was, he was cool. Look, he was not easy on us. He was a down-to-earth person. He knew his football. We did some innovative stuff he had learned from Michigan. He was kind of like a father figure, and he might have beat the hell out of you, but he cared about you. And we were coming off, you know, a person that you hated to a person that you could like. I remember the Brother Rice game was one of my better games as a, as a junior. I was real good at, at sneaking out when they would have a screen pass, because. The offensive tackle would always like push you a little bit away. As soon as I saw the quarterback make a move to throw the ball, I, I stepped in front and I intercepted a pass. And then I recovered a couple fumbles here and there. And when the season was over, I was number one tackle. How did I make it? I don't know.
They told me I went from 190 as a junior to, to about 225. Film sessions, I would get yelled at like you wouldn't believe. Pataki, look at yourself. And he'd run it back and run it. I know women do better than you. But he used it as a motivator. But then the next week, we play Mendel, and I'm a line minute a week for the Chicago area. And it was funny because I got to be friends with some of the Mendel guys years later. They said, what's going on there? Or why can't you stop that guy? And, and they said, we're trying, but we can't. And I'm like, wait, how can I one day be that bad and then the next week be that good? That stuck with me the rest of my life. When I did something wrong, I just would never let it happen again. Frank Maloney brought me down. He says, you know, uh, I'll do all the talking I can for you, but you don't have the grade point. You know, you're, you have a 1.7 GPA and you're not gonna be able to bring that up. But then for some reason, University of New Mexico looked at me and they liked me. University of New Mexico sent me to a junior college. One day I was playing basketball at Mitchell Birders across the street in Antitest. He said, you got a phone call. And it was the coach from Oklahoma Military Academy. And he said that we, we would like to have you play for us. So would you come? And I said, absolutely. I started offense and defense probably the first two or maybe three games. But the added time on the clock and the weather out there was different from Chicago. I didn't play with all the effectiveness I should have. After Oklahoma, a guy by the name of Ron Madrick said, uh, we'll get you in a school called Murray State in Kentucky. And I thought, oh, what the hell? I was working in a steel mill at the time and I said, I'll try Murray State. It was a different way of life down there and I really didn't like it. And we were in 0-10 season. We practiced year round. I wound up quitting because I said, you're not gonna offer me a scholarship. I shouldn't have done that because I probably would have been a starter the next year. But I didn't like the South. So when I got to Chicago, I thought it was all over. I remember going to work in a steel mill. I didn't know what to do. I could have went to Northern for spring practice and I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to go to spring practice. That was my mistake. I was only gonna play the meat squad because the team is already made in the spring practice. And I didn't realize that. But I knew, I knew in my junior, I wasn't gonna play. They wouldn't, he wouldn't even consider me. I started at spring practice. I was number one on the chart. You know, when we came to double sessions, the guy who was third string came back in top physical shape. You know, he, he wound up being a starter there. You know, he beat me out. games and things, I was sore until Thursday. And the, the trainer told me, he says, that's your body telling you you've had it. I didn't continue, you know, I knew that was it. So now I know I'm done with football. So the only other thing I can possibly do is coach. But the one thing I remembered, which kind of stuck in my craws, I picked up a newspaper, which was a Chicago Public School newspaper, and they had all the football programs in there. And I wondered to myself, I said, why can't the public league beat the Catholic league? I remember saying that. First time I saw her, first time she saw me, I was starting to fight. About four o'clock in the afternoon, I'm watching a softball game, starting trouble, and I saw her. You know, she was at the game, you know. She was just a beautiful, beautiful woman. She really was. I was in a bar and I was trying to bench press the pool table. I looked up and I saw her. She looked down at me and she just shook her head. Someone came over and said, ask her out. So I asked her out, you know, and she went with me and took her to a movie and then we just started going out. I remember it was on uh, February 14th. We got married April 14th. And I remember we got married, went back to the apartment on Monday 
at spring practice, and she came to the uh, spring practice. I says, this is the life of football coach, you know, she kind of understood that. I remember when she walked off the field, a couple of coaches said, very good choice, they said, very beautiful looking woman. It was August, and my good friend Joe Kovac says, why don't we go to work, be a substitute teacher in Chicago Board of Ed. So I, I wound up subbing, and it was football season, and I knew Bernie O'Brien, the head coach, and I said, if you get me as a substitute teacher at CVS, I will, uh, I'll coach for nothing, no, no problem. And there was a guy who was always taken off from, from school. He was a World War II veteran, but he took so many days off that they put him as a substitute teacher and gave me his class. So I literally taught history. So I started coaching there, and I started coaching the way I was coached at Mount Carmel. I would run them to death. We had six tackles that were over 275 pounds. By the time the season was over, they were between 250 and 240. That's where I found out that these kids were probably better athletes than the ones in the Catholic League, but they didn't have the discipline instilled in them. For three years, it might have been, I was an assistant coach at the school. The leader of the school was a guy by the name of Reggie Brown, who was the, the, the principal, Dr. Brown. He was, one, he was the main reason I stayed. He was the, the, the catalyst that made me become a principal. The two previous years before I took over the head coach, we had won the public league championship and beat some tremendous teams and got our tails kicked by the, the, the Catholic schools. Uh, 1976, first year as a head coach, I really had a great mentor in Bernie O'Brien. He taught me a lot of uh, things about dealing with people. Bernie O'Brien didn't leave me hanging. He left me with a lot of good athletes, but there were certain things that I wanted to do, and as a head coach, you do it. I, I wound up getting some people around me that were, that, that were pretty loyal to me. We ran the program in 76, which was kind of a new thing, like in my senior year at Northern Illinois. We were going to be in top physical shape, so we ran, we ran, we ran. As we went into our first game, you know, you could see it start paying off. Tough kids on 39th Street at Phillips. I mean, just tough, tough kids, but our kids were tough too. We, we squeaked by and I think we beat them eight to six. You know, as the games were going, we played the Simeon. We beat the Simeon, and uh, Al Scott walked right off the field, didn't shake my hand. You know, when we got into the playoffs, we, we played uh, Austin. You know, we handled them pretty good. And then when we got to Lane Tech, now Lane Tech, they just hammered every team they played. Derwood Curtis said, you know, since we're always going to the middle, why don't we fake the middle and then have everybody run to the side. And we did that and scored a touchdown right off the bat. I was a, a, a slug them out type of coach. Put your first downs, put them in bad field position, wound up beating them. And then we prepared for St. Rita, which was the prep bowl. They had a banquet every year where the Catholic and the public league coaches would come. We had a beautiful hotel downtown. And I remember when I got up and I had to make a speech, one of the last words I said to the coach at St. Rita, I said, I don't know if we'll win or lose, but I promise you this, coach, we're gonna come out and we're gonna hit you. We're gonna hit you hard. About the, the second quarter, and I remember Lowell Williams saying to me, give it to the big man. Oh, it was fourth down at three yards. He says, in years past, we would have punted the ball. Let's go after him. So I, we gave it to this guy, Meredith Hale, who's a tremendous football player. And I remember we ran it to the side, Sean Taylor's side. We got the first down. So the next play, uh, Coach Williams says, and our quarterback, he reminded me of it later. He said, let's run the Pennock fly, which was a play, a play where Ron Pennock would go out and just get free. And I said, run the Pennock fly. And I'll be darned if he, don't, he didn't tip that ball four or five times, caught it, went in the end zone. And we kind of broke Rita's back because the public league had not scored in a few years. Defensively, Harry Watson did a pretty good job. He, he kept attacking them. I remember going on the field with maybe a minute and 20 seconds left saying, we got the ball, you fire out just like it's a first quarter. This is why we ran 20 hundred yard wind sprints. Why we did. Right now, this is the defining moment of what's gonna happen. And Mike Luke runs a 40 yard touchdown. They were stunned. And then we had him, and it was only a matter of seconds left in the ball game. I remember looking up and saying, thank you, God. I walked across the field. There was the coach from St. Rita, Cronin, crying. And I'm like, 
Very good game, sir. And I turned around and walked away. I walked in the locker room and I told him, you guys have made history today. On the way back, Watson turned around and he says, take a look at this. They were sleeping. They were literally sleeping. You know, they had given their all. And I thought to myself, they're going to be successful in life. And all of them were. The thing I was shocked about getting, which I remember in the newspaper, it said the frosting on the cake. I became the coach of the year, you know, for the Chicagoland area. And I remember going to a bar that I used to frequent with my wife and the boys. I call up Bernie O'Brien, and I thank him. He's a class man. He says, you did a great job. You know, you deserve all the credit. I walked into a restaurant one day, and somebody noticed, you know, hey, Coach Pataki. And other people looked up. Because of what we did, we, we, we had beaten the, the Catholic League. I had been on TV so much and in the newspapers. People were just, they started applauding. Looking forward to being a father. And I, I remember we were, we were eating uh, steak with peas and onions. My mom said, uh, I think my water just broke when we went in the hospital. Got in the car and I'm driving in the blizzard. And I got the air conditioning on. And of course the window was shrinking like this. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? And she said, maybe you should shut the air conditioning off. I'll tell you how crazy that is too. When the doctor came out, him and I lit up a cigarette and started smoking. I mean, I was afraid to hold a baby, you know. I, I didn't know what to do. And then you get used to it as time goes on. You start, you know, you're able to uh, change the diaper and all the other stuff and feed the child. And, but you don't sleep. You wind up not sleeping. It changes your life completely. If you go somewhere, you take half your house with you. Everything evolves around the child, you know. So, it, it, yeah, it's a, it's a major change. So living in Cal City was something, and the dream was to go to South Holland. So we went and built a brand new home there and a new development. Times change with kids, you know. I worked out at school because I built a weight room there. I'd go early in the morning or during a lunch period or something, I would find a way to work out with weights. So you get up at two, change the diaper, don't end it, it's two, it's three. The next thing you know, it's four. You might get another 45 minutes worth of sleep, and then you go to work. I say to my kids, and I still do, I love you. That word is tough to come out of my mouth. I try to teach to my children basic fundamental. They were taught just like the football players were taught. One of the things I threw at them all the time, what would you rather have, love or money? Love. Would you rather be happy or have money? You'd rather be happy than have a lot of money. You have to go to Disney World. You know, you have to take that plane and, and go there. You enjoy those things. I think of the one picture, I, I brought a couple pieces of equipment home one time accidentally and they put the helmet on with the shoulder pads and CVS football on it and I still have that picture. At CVS was not bad at all. It was, in fact, it was the best vocational school in the Midwest and then Reggie Brown left. Behind my back, they were making arrangements with a coach that was at Austin to come to CVS. The, the athletic director, Henry Saltzinski, says the principal wants to see, and I went downstairs, and he said, you've been bumped. And I said, you got to be kidding me, and I'm the head football coach. He says, since you're there, you can't be the head coach. And it was all planned, and I wound up going to Carver for two years. When I was at Carver, there was an opening at Cook County Juvenile Center. I was gonna take that job. The principal called me in from CVS and he said, we want you back. I said, you gotta be kidding me. He says, no, we need you back at CVS. Football program was, was a mess. I said, well, let me think in just a second because I got a job that's got a lot more money. It was like two o'clock in the morning. I went downstairs and I put the TV on and it was at the beginning of a movie, Trouble Along the Way, which was the only movie that John Wayne about him being a football coach. The person Judge St. Anthony's by the standard of other colleges. I'm willing to take a chance on And it was like God said to me, go back to CBS. I finished my cigarette, went back upstairs, and then I took the job at CBS. When I went back with a different attitude, I went back with an attitude of, I'm going to create super characters, the kind you would want. You know, I didn't concentrate on winning and losing, I concentrated on building character in the kids. They understood me, you know, there was no such thing. You, you're gonna get hurt, tape yourself up, keep going, man. That's what the game is like. You know, that's what life is like. And you're gonna have ups and downs, get hurt here and this, and you gotta keep pushing along. 
And when they thought they were tired and couldn't keep going, I pushed them more. So that's what we did. I thought, you know, every time I get a chance, you know what, I'm gonna take my kids to football practice. But I knew I had to do that. I had to spend time with my kids. I wish I spent more time, you know. I left CVS because I think that I had run the course as far as being a head coach was concerned. I felt that God put me on this earth to help people. So I wanted to be a principal. I wound up going to Washington High School, uh, which I didn't know at the time. I wound up being the disciplinarian. Uh, then I also wound up being a uh, assistant principal there. And I had given up coaching. I missed football. There's a job open up at Mount Carmel. I went and I applied for the job, and I remember Frank Lenti. It wasn't like you were gonna get the job right away. He didn't make it easy on you. Even though I was a head coach for, what, 13 years, it didn't matter. So I wound up going to Mount Carmel. And they were a very intricate system. They ran the program like a, a major college program. That's why he's so successful. Coaching there, you've been working seven days a week. I didn't like the limelight as, as being a head coach. I really didn't. I could concentrate about just working with these kids on techniques and fundamentals. I remember uh, Tom Sula, we were sitting in a, at the bus and he, he says, wouldn't it be great if we could win another state championship? You know, working at Mount Conway, yeah, you get pumped, man. You, look, you feel like somebody. I remember getting off the bus from one state championship and the people were just lined up around Mount Carmel. It was unbelievable. You know, the old fashioned way, you just, I just tip my hat to them. But I was only a, a spoke in a wheel. You know, I coached Simeon Rice. I worked with him every day. He didn't really fit within the system. And if you let him play his own game, he'd make things happen. I did something I never should have done. I went against the coach. And I said, they're in the game. I want you to look at me. When they call that defense, if I give you a signal, you jet, and you just go after that ball. So in the championship game, we were down. Final minutes, it doesn't look like we're gonna win a ball game. Simeon's on the outside, they call the defense, and I said, jet, I said, go after the ball. Quarterback went back, put his arm back, and, and he had a technique where he could put his arm around and tap the ball, and he did it. And there was a fumble, and we recovered, and the next thing you know, we scored a touchdown and win the championship. Now, you never tell anybody about those things, but they never knew what we did. We actually did that throughout the season, and it really worked. Simeon Rice and Chris Sorch, they're all just one or two. There's so many others, but those are, you know, those are guys are few and far between. There was, you know, I, I think of some of the other guys you coached. The thing about coaching and teaching is you're, you're helping people for life. Football coaches make that decision, you know. They, they help people out, and that's what it's all about. When I got to my sons, it was fun and scary. My chest was that big. Matthew had worked his way up and worked so damn hard, you know, through a lot of adversity. told Andy not to be a quarterback, and I was always on him. Andy would always say to me with that confidence he had, Dad, there's no one better than me. I'm the only one. The one has the tenacity that I have. The other one is strong and, and, and silent, but they're both very respectful to society. And that greatest achievement, that's it. And, you know, being 70 years old, when I look at those things, I feel like, you know, you accomplished something. How do I want to be remembered? I don't know. I want to be remembered as Coach Potts because I had a great brother who taught me the fundamental things, you know, how to survive in life and how to help other people, beat up the bullies, help the people that need help. His name was Potts and I was Little Potts. Thanks, Dennis, for what you did for me because look what you've done for all these other people. And that's how I would want to be remembered, you know, as Coach Potts. Choked up a little. Mm -hmm. uh.